You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to Barbell Logic. This is producer Trent. Matt is not here today because he is out on vacation and celebrating his 20th anniversary. So first of all, congrats to Matt and Miss Rachel Reynolds for 20 years. And since Matt is out, today what we're going to do is hear from some of the rest of the Barbell Logic staff. Nikki Sims and Andrew Jackson got on Zoom and recorded a discussion about coaching and specifically what they get out of coaching. So this is a little bit different spin on things. We've talked about the benefits of coaching here as a new lifter. And it's kind of obvious, right? A coach can help you get started with excellent technique. A coach can make sure that that technique stays good and stays consistent over time. A coach can help you navigate programming, can even help you with nutrition, all sorts of stuff. So a coach is a wonderful thing for a new lifter, but coaches are also useful for people that have been lifting for a long time. As we've talked about many times in the programming episodes and on the MED Masterclass, Programming gets kind of complicated when you're an advanced lifter, but even beyond that, coaching can also serve as a source of accountability to make sure that you're, you're staying on top of your training and also a way to keep things fresh. You know, working with a coach that has different experiences than you, that has a different knowledge base, can introduce you to some training methods and help you push your fitness in a direction that you may not have ever considered before. So in short, coaches need coaches. And advanced lifters need coaches. And that's what Andrew and Nikki are going to talk about today. Now, please bear in mind that with all the COVID stuff going on right now, it's very difficult to get audio equipment and create the same kind of recording environment that you're used to with Matt and Scott. So what you're going to hear today is from Andrew and Nikki's Zoom feed. And we did the best we could with it, but the audio is not quite up to the same standard that you're used to here at Barbell Logic. But we're doing the best we can with the circumstances being what they are. So without further ado, let's listen to what Andrew and Nikki have to say about coaching. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. And I was also going to welcome you to the Barbell Logic Podcast. <laughs> We're officially hijacking this from Matt, who's both of our coaches. That's right. Um, yeah, it feels like we're being sneaky, although I think he'll be totally okay with this. <laughs> yeah. He's on vacation, so ask us to uh, record a, a podcast. And uh, yeah. it was interesting because we were talking the other day, totally unrelated. Hold on there, I, mister. People oh. need to know who you're listening to. So, of course. I am going to introduce my co-host here. This is Andrew Jackson. I'd be surprised if most of you don't know who he is, but he is Barbell Logic's uh, vice president of, what is it again? Operations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hard time. He's our vice president of operations, which involves a lot of processes and spreadsheets and workflow stuff and things that he's really good at and things that I'm not very good at. So that works really mm. well. <laughs> he's also um, an Instagram celebrity for lifting in the forest, um, mm. which he doesn't do anymore. Now he's got like a normal person garage. Um, <laughs> But from the woods, <laughs> he's like one of just he's just a cool, neat dad who lifts. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, I am here with uh, Nikki Sims, of course. Everyone on this podcast knows who that is, our <laughs> vice president of human resources, and uh, a coach with Barbell Logic for over three years now since the very beginning of time, December 2016. In fact, mm. we were one. Of, we were both two of the initial 16. Yeah, that's coaches. true. Yeah. We've been working together for a while and uh, I'm excited to do this podcast. Yeah, likewise. We have, we get, we actually have a lot of interesting stuff in common because, like Andrew said, we are both coached by Matt. We're both coaches. So we have kind of an interesting perspective on um, being coaches and getting coached and talking about our coach behind his back. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that was kind of how the idea for this podcast got started is that we were uh, chatting and I just started feeling uh, curious about, as an advanced lifter yourself and an experienced coach, what you feel like you get the most value out of 
coaching or having a coach, I guess I should say. Um, and uh, so I'm kind of interested in getting to ask you a bunch of questions about your experience with being coached and, uh, and what it is that you like about having a coach. Mm, okay. That's, that's sort of like the theme, I think, for today. Yeah, I like that. Since so, I think a lot of our listeners are getting coached or want to be coaches or think about lifting all the bloody time like we do. So, yeah. 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 And I think sometimes people wonder like, well, if I've been doing this for a while, do I really need a coach? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, yeah. You've been, you've been lifting for over 10 years now, right? I think so. If you count my CrossFit days as lifting, but yeah, mm. I've been doing things in the gym for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And yet still find value in having a coach. Yeah. Even more so over the last couple of years. I, so I worked with, I've actually worked with Matt twice. I worked with him probably three years ago, closer to when Barbell Logic first started. And then I fired him. (laughs) Um, I don't know if I remember why. And I wasn't even working with him for that long, which I know is a problem is it? it really takes a, a, a minute, especially as an advanced lifter to get used to things. Yeah. How did that conversation go? Um, gosh, let's see if I remember the medium. I probably did something shady, like break up over text. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the one liner. We're done. <laughs> it's not you. It's definitely me. Um, oh, always, always. <laughs> I have definitely than ghosting <laughs> attention. Everybody in the world better than ghosting. <laughs> it is funny though, how, um, whenever somebody, a client leaves, it mm-hmm. always feels like a breakup. Oh my like, God. Painful. Every email or text or message I've ever gotten, I could copy paste that into a breakup uh, yeah. message. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. do you feel like he, uh, he like, was there any emotional tension there, especially because you were working for him at the time? Yeah, I think it felt, it felt okay to me. And honestly, I don't really remember anything negative about it. So mm-hmm. I think it felt okay. I think it was just like me just needing to like, explore and figure things out <laughs> and so you went to go coach yourself for a period of time yeah and it was then How'd that go? I coached myself not very well um <laughs> <laughs> i've noticed there's like a phase of lifters where they start lifting and then they get a coach for a little while and then they start to get an, enough knowledge to be dangerous with, with programming them like okay mm-hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna program for myself i don't think programming for yourself is a great idea because you are Mm. the worst. Maybe some people are better at this, but like, it's so hard to be biased when you coach yourself. Like Mm. so easy to think like, Oh, that squat didn't go well. Time to pivot. Mm. Mm. www.powerliftingprograms.com. What can I do now? Like it's so easy to lose sight of the bigger picture and just make like more emotional reactions. Or I think I was running off of like RPE, program so it's just like Mm -hmm. that completely opened the door for just like well how do you feel about that what do you feel you should do next and oh was that too hard there's like just like no not go well (laughs) right a lot of variables that you're all having to try to evaluate while reacting to it also physically emotionally Mm -hmm. psychologically yeah Yeah. interesting so you rehired matt out of that as well yeah yeah and That went pretty well, although it still took us a long time to get into a pretty good kind of beat. Mm. Um, And I know we had like a really difficult meet together where I like totally had a terrible meet. And you probably have some perspective on this, but like, man, when you have a client who's competing, that is a gut wrenching day. Oh yeah. Way worse than being a competitor in my experience. (laughs) (laughs) you just feel everything and you know yeah. how hard the client works and like, you yeah. know, it's on the line for them. And yeah. you also know that things can be a bit unpredictable on meet day. Not everything is unpredictable, but like you can't have as much control over it as you want. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if they don't have a good meet day. It's just like, shit. Yeah. In their hearts. So coming out of that though, you stayed with him. Yeah. And have since had good meets. Yeah. Then we've had really good needs. So yeah. how did you, how do you go about that? Like when you're kind of debriefing or, or evaluating the programming up to the meet, the performance of the meet, how do you know whether to stay? Well, how did you decide to stay working with him until the, 
Um, I think what's been really important for me is to give myself a cooling off period mm. after a competition or after a big day because mm. um, I know I'll get really worked up about competitions uh, a mm. lot. And so if it doesn't go how I want it to go, or even if it goes well, I still have to have like a cooling off period. And I'll usually share some of that information with my coach or with Matt and just be like, mm-hmm. I think this went really well, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And thank you. I just always try to be really grateful. Um, but I think it's good to have like a week or so cooling off period before you like yeah. make a huge shift because, you know, you have so much on the line, but like uh, after that, or maybe during that time frame, I think it's good to ask some hard questions like why did why do you think this happened was it because of this and maybe it's not sometimes it's really productive for what is going to happen with the programming next time but i think it's really productive just to like get some shit off your chest Mm -hmm. because like you might have some things where like you went a certain way during a part of your programming cycle and that's happened to me where it's just like why did we do that like this wasn't how we did it before like but then you know you're you're trusting you're trying to be Mm -hmm. in that relationship where you're trusting your coach Mm -hmm. but then you know when you're looking at it from you know after your third deadlift like things look i think it's good to actually have those conversations and it's good to have a coach who you can have those conversations with so that you Mm -hmm. can kind of go into the next few months or whatever programming knowing that you can be listened to and that um you actually can analyze what did and didn't work well Right. So you you have a, a collaborative kind of a relationship with your coach. Like yeah. you ask or you suggest things that you'd like to try in the program and kind of dialogue about what to, where to go next or how to change things going forward. Yeah. And sometimes I just do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'm a squeaky wheel. Sometimes I'm just like, I'm just going to start doing walking lunges and glute bridges, and then I'll let him know about it. (laughs) (laughs) But I think the interesting thing for you and I is that we've been coaching for so long and then we coach. So it's like, am I going to try and be a know-it-all or am I going to listen? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough line to walk. And then even for Matt, like as him as our coach, I imagine he's like, well, I won't have to explain this because she probably already knows because she's a coach. When I'm coaching people who are advanced, like I have to make sure that I'm not taking for granted things that Mm -hmm. I should be explaining to them. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's your current state. Let's back up a bit to the beginning. Like what, how did you, what was your first coach? Like, what was that? Do you remember your first coach and what that experience was like? Or just anything or Uh, in general? Yeah. Like how do you, where did that yeah, in sports or Gosh, growing up? I think I I'm just curious, like your kind of the evolution of your uh, experience with coaching from as far back as you can remember or along you know the way, what? if there's anybody that stayed out. I remember playing soccer when I was in like, I think I was in elementary school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hated it. Um, <laughs> but that's because... what it is. You played soccer. <laughs> yeah, sure. what, what did you hate about it? I hated the running. I just like, I can't. <laughs> I hate the pressure. It was mm-hmm. like, cause I'm not very good. And so, but if I mess it up, like all the parents are just like, you're a disappointment. Not my parents, but like wow. parents, parents of the kids who are actually good. Like, and I don't know wow. if they said that, but man, I felt that. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. <laughs> and like, you know, if you like miss a pass or whatever, if you like miss a goal, like, Oh, oh, that's not yeah, that's it. yeah. So not a huge, uh, like not a major life impact if a uh, coach kind of experience. Was there a first coach where you, I mean, cause you, you've now made coaching your career, your profession, and, mm-hmm. and maybe, maybe it hasn't happened. Uh, it certainly did for me, but so I'm curious if there was a coach along the way somewhere that maybe it was in sports, maybe it was just a, in life or somebody that you considered a coach that stood out to you in a way that made it seem like something that uh, that you would want to pursue or that you really appreciated the influence that a good coach could have Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe not maybe you just didn't experience that until you became a coach yourself 
Well, yeah, I think when I started getting into CrossFit, I joined a CrossFit gym. It was a two mm-hmm. coach there. Um, okay. Gina, these are their names. Um, and, you know, that's, it was shortly after I started doing that, that I totally switched careers from being a, an estimator in sort of general contracting firm to mm-hmm. <laughs> being a CrossFit coach. And it came with a huge pay raise. I um, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think the impact that they uh, provided was, I don't know, that you could have really fun. You could have a lot of fun with it and there are lots of things that you could do with it. And I don't know, I think mm-hmm. it would be more of the community. So I'm curious with all, with the experiences that you've had with coaches along the way, what are the things that stand out to you as what makes them the great coaches, at least what makes them good? Like, what is it that they, mm-hmm. they do for you or, or how, how they work with you that, that you think makes it worthwhile to have a coach? Yeah. Makes, makes your experience better as a lifter. Yeah. And that's definitely something that's changed over the course of lifting for so long, but you know, when it's, when it's early on, like you want them to help you fix everything, mm-hmm. Just like fix my back flexion or like, why are my knees always caving? And like, why haven't I hit a PR in forever? And it's just like, fix everything. Mm-hmm. You need to fix everything for me. <laughs> like, right. And then I think it shifts where you start to learn how to take more responsibility for things. Mm-hmm. And then being more advanced, I like having, I've actually liked having a, the same coach for a long amount of time because the same cues that I hear over and over again, I still get the same cues over and over again on some things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> elbow flare. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that one before. Your elbow's flare too? Like, uh, every single bench session. What? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually get a, my favorite now is he calls it on like rep one. He'll say uh, that it was good, but he, he'll be like, I'm waiting for it. Or like waiting for three or something like that. Like here comes the elbow flare. Like, Cause he gives me video feedback, like real time. So he's like, yeah. he's like color commenting the reps for a set of five and uh, calls the elbow flare shot like three reps ahead. And- yep. And even like while I'm benching, I'm like, and I just know, I'll be like, okay, well, he's going to tell me about my elbow flare. Even though I can't feel it, <laughs> I can't feel elbow flare. Can anybody feel elbow flare? And if you can, uh, please I, let me know. Please call in right now <laughs> to the show. <laughs> you need elbow flare and or something like that. Like. <laughs> but honestly, even that has made me, and I maybe I've just adapted to it. And I'm just like, well, I'm going to figure out a way to fix it. Yeah. And yeah. so it makes me kind of explore ways to, but he lets me know that that's important. And I'm just like, okay, well that cue doesn't work, but I'm going to fix it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, for me having Matt as a coach, even though like I joke about the elbow flare situation, but having somebody who's got that experience and attention to detail and, um, just kind of relentless, um, expectation that things need to get better. And he keeps mm. focusing on smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller points. And some of them are really chronic patterns that are difficult to change, but that process has, has made my lifting significantly better in the time that I've worked with him. And, mm. uh, I don't, you know, if I, even though I made some progress when I was coaching myself, I let myself get away with a lot of those things. Right. Mm. I wouldn't quite hold that same standard. Um, and that, that's one of the things you let yourself get away with. Oh, uh, well, my bench in particular was super sloppy. Um, and you just like you didn't know. bench, right? I, well, yeah, first of all, I just would not program it because I didn't really, <laughs> I, I didn't appreciate it. Well, what, and that's actually another thing that I found is that um, I would not do things because I didn't appreciate the, um, the complexity of it, or I didn't, I didn't see all of those details and it was actually a combination of working with Jordan Stanton at a bench press camp mm-hmm. and also Matt Reynolds as a coach that I was able to start seeing some of the finer points of even something like the bench, which, you know, typically is sort of like the bro lift that people just kind of so much great stuff to the bench. There is. And well, and you actually at some of the seminars you've um, there's been a couple of times where you've pointed out a detail or you've, used a cue and it just shifts my perspective on, on the lift. And I'm able to see that level of detail. And I think that's true. Anytime you, 
you talk to somebody or you meet somebody who understands something at a, at a level of depth that you don't mm-hmm. see and you're able to step into that perspective mm. and, and then you can appreciate something at a level that, that you didn't before. Um, mm-hmm. So that definitely changed for me with something like the bench, which, which I enjoy a lot more now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think that that also applies to like programming? So working with the coach will be like, okay, well I will get to learn about programming now from another. Yeah, person. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think that the more advanced you are in your career, having uh, that insight from a coach who's done more programming options or, or programming uh use different tools or, or different, uh, exercises or variations that I didn't have experience with. And, uh, you know, as a lifter, you build comfort and experience with, with different programs or different exercises and having somebody program stuff that's outside of your comfort zone. Mm. Um, and that maybe you don't have experience with, I think helps add that to your, your toolkit, not only as a lifter, but then also, as a coach, there's things that I'm more confident in using mm-hmm. for my clients because I've had that involved uh, yeah. in my program. So um, he's definitely brought in different rep schemes, um, you know, different variations. I bought chains recently. I, had, I hadn't really, I'd used them a few times in my past, but mm-hmm. uh, I definitely think that makes a, a difference. Yeah. Uh, it's like a, it's like cooking and baking. It's just like, you learn to get like more confident with trying something or you just know like, Oh, that combination doesn't work well with each other. Or it's right. like, oh, this is a time when we need to be really precise and exact versus this is a time when we can be a little more fluid and change things. And right. the more it gives you more confidence to kind of explore that. Right. And also different, different experiences with uh, problems or sticking points, I think mm. is something that is a huge value add of, of having, a coach that somebody who's encountered those, those problems or sticking points or encountered them with different people or more people. Mm -hmm. Um, so instead of what I, what I experienced personally is that, and where I think a coach, no matter what level you are, can make a difference is that you can figure a lot of this stuff out on your own, I think, Mm -hmm. or you could program for yourself or you could try to fix technical issues, but the time that it takes is orders of magnitude longer mm-hmm. to figure it out. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're trying to do uh, your first program by yourself, you're going to run into almost weekly. You're going to run into problems that you're trying to figure out for the first time that somebody else has coached people through hundreds of times, and they're simple problems to fix. Yeah. So you might figure it out in three to six months, whereas the coach can get you through in a in a week or a session. Yeah. And the same is true at, even at the advanced level. You know, it's more complex. There's more variables. There's different problems. But I think having a coach there it enables you to get through those those sticking points faster. That I've equated, and I've equated like coaching to like learning a language, or even lifting to learning a language. Like even when you mm-hmm. just start lifting, like the very basic like Spanish 101, where it's just like, how do you say shoes? How do you mm-hmm. say how do you say mm-hmm. student and it's like words that you never really use <laughs> right right but, and that's also you could even equate it to just lifting on your own or just like oh i'm going to download an app and try and learn a language it's right like, cool. i'll just walk around my house and say this is bread and this is water <laughs> like, yeah but when you actually start to need to have a conversation then you start to learn about like oh now i need to figure out how to use this word and now i need to put this sentence together and then the longer and longer you learn it and study it and interact with it, like it just is like becomes part of your, you think in that language. And I yeah. think that's a really cool thing that happens to like a more advanced coach is that it's not just like seeing something and regurgitating something. It's just like, mm-hmm. you'll see something and you can predict something and right. also know like all the other branches of where that might be coming from. And it right. comes from talking about it and having coach and actually being curious and, Mm-hmm. Like said like making a lot of connections right and then for the rest of your life you can say don't ask all that biblioteca <laughs> it's just like cemented in place I like that, that job. good <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs>
Uh, so one of the other questions I think I asked you that got me thinking about this also was, um, I was curious, actually, I think we were talking about the elbow flare and, uh, it got me curious, like, because we get feedback on every single session yeah. and, you know, do you, even as an advanced lifter, do you, do you find value in getting feedback on all three lifts every session? Yes, I do. Tell me about that. Um, yeah, I was thinking that, and then, I mean, maybe I just like someone paying attention to me. <laughs> I, yeah. I think that's probably a big thing that a lot of us, maybe not all of us will admit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but most of my lists and depending on where I am in the program, like most of my lists are going to look fine. It's just like, okay, this is just like kind of volume worth, like, you yeah. know what you're doing. Um, right. But maybe there's something, it makes me stay accountable even during those phases where it's just right. like, if, if I know that someone's going to be looking at this then like, I better not dick around. Like I better, just, like, better do what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. So I find that helpful, even if it's just like, yeah, that looks good, but it also provides, and this works for online coaching, there's going to be a mechanism of communication. So if mm -hmm. I do have a question, I'm not sure mm -hmm. about something, that's where I know I can ask it and I will get an answer. Right. So like mm -hmm. the portal is open. So nice. I find that really helpful. And I honestly think that it makes the coach pay attention more. Like mm -hmm. if you're only getting a couple workouts looked at every month or even every week, like, they just don't get to see as much. And yeah. so when yeah. the programming does change and when things get a little more important, like as the weight on the bar goes up and things get more meaningful, like towards a competition or something, mm -hmm. they know where you've come from. Yeah. I think it's uh, hugely important as a coach to watch all the videos uh, in, in every single session. I, I build... And I don't even know if I do it intentionally, but I, I feel like I, I develop an eye for the lifters bar speed, mm -hmm. their, their kind of emotional state. I can start to read their body language, you know, how they react to the lift or just how they, whether they're attacking the lift or whether it looks like there's something going on. There's been many, many times where, the day itself, there's nothing in particularly special about it. It might even just be a light day. And there's something about the way they're moving or the way they're behaving that mm. I pick up on and maybe I make a comment on and, oh, it turns out there's this big other thing happening in their life. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have said anything about it. Like they would have just kind of posted the numbers and moved on. But because we are paying attention to Mm -hmm. Every single day, every single lift, I think it builds that relationship like you're talking about that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, there's a communication there that goes beyond just the sets, reps, and the weight that you did and whether you got it done or not. I, I don't even know if I could program very well. I mean, I could, but I don't, I wouldn't be as confident about my program. And I wouldn't yeah, be as, I, I really hate when I have to program without seeing videos. Yeah. Like it feels good. Cause I'm like, well, I'm done in like four minutes, but it's also just like, well, I just spewed out stuff. I don't really know if it's going to work. Like I just yeah. like just drive by and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the margin margin of um, error or buffer that you have to like build into the program is, is significantly greater. I think yeah. so you can get a, I think the program can be more, a lot more effective um, also when you're following along. With, yeah with their kind of with their evolution yeah um, it, cuz it's interesting too that you don't necessarily know how they're going to respond to some changes mm -hmm. and and then when you see that the bar's fly the bar speed's flying when you thought it was going to be a grinder yeah um it can you know it can definitely change the direction you're going i think for me it's like i need my coach to have a lot of faith in what's coming up for me day. Yeah. Like I need to just be like, you've, I need, and I will do everything that I can in my power so that I can say, I have done everything that I can to get ready for this competition. Mm. I like being able to go into a meet thinking that. Yeah. And so then if my coach is always just can't agree with that, then I feel really good going into a meet. And if they give mm. me like a couple of cues to think about, not, I, I don't need to freaking hear, keep your knees out on your squat. Like, 
Right. I, that is the last thing I need to hear. Like mm-hmm. I need them to know what happens to me when I'm lifting super heavy weight so that they can prepare me for that, not to have mm-hmm. the textbook lifts. Right. Right. Yeah. And you know, like it's, there are some points where it, it's really nice when a coach matches your level of care, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why it's good. And I have had a lot of dialogue with Matt about this stuff too. And she'd be like, you know what, Matt, for my squat and meet day, I just want to go three for three. I don't care right. about it. That's fine. So there, you know what, they're going to get there. He's going to help me get three for three on my squat. That's cool. And right. it's like, then, you know what, I really want to, I really want to hit a PR. Like what do we have to do to hit a PR? And then it's just like, you know what, I want to go all out for my deadlift. What do I have to do for that? Right. And so yeah. I tell them how important certain things are. And then they like reaffirm, reaffirm the importance of that. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting that it's, um, it's not just that the coach cares, but that it's the, the matched care that you, yeah. I think was what you called it. Like they need to be uh, on the same page as you about what's important. Yeah. At that particular time. And I, and I think that actually connects also to that, having that relationship and that kind of constant communication, because those things change all the time, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. maybe right now it's lunges and glute bridges that yeah. matters. Um, <laughs> maybe right now it's the, the, the deadlift or the bench or a total, you know, mm-hmm. and, and different, that can totally change the program and yeah. priorities. The thing that's uh, interesting there though is, you can't, coaches can't get taken advantage of by their lifters. Ooh, I see that with, okay. a lot, with a lot of newer coaches where it's just like, well, my client really wants to do this now. So then they like flip flop mm-hmm. over to this and it's like, there, there has to be, the coach has to really, you know, have a stake in the ground and be like, you know what? I can, I'm hearing that you want this. It seems like this is actually what's important to you. Is that still corresponding to what you told me three weeks ago? Like, Mm, if there's right. if there's a lot of flip flopping, like if it's a flip flop every month, something else is yeah. going on. And yes. I found that the more coaches cater to those kind of whims, the sooner the client leaves because it ends up oh, like interesting. Doesn't have a backbone. Yeah, and interesting. So and that, you see that across the like you have the perspective of seeing every client. Well, not anymore. For a long time, you were seeing every cancellation. And yeah interacting with them. That's something you picked up from, from yeah. watching that. Yeah. And from like, from, you know, maybe like difficult client interactions where it's like, and this, mm-hmm. I'm, I know I've done this before. Um, and I'm not saying anything that I've never done. Like I've totally mm-hmm. been there. It's like, well, my client wants to do this and I feel like they need to do what they want. These are their goals. And here I am to support them, their goals, but they just keep moving around all over the time, all over mm-hmm. the place. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how can I, still be the professional that I'm supposed to be for them, but also not get walked all over, you know, right. and maybe it's just that they want something that you can't give them as their strength coach. Right. Yeah. But you have to like actually dig in like, where's, where's this coming from? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? Like when you try to find out what the client actually needs? Um, I try to ask them, as many questions as I can um, to get them talking about what they care about. It's kind of goes back to your, like, what, what do you care about um, match? Uh, That's the starting point. And I think from there it's, I mean, I'm a strength coach, so I'm always going to perceive and funnel things through how can I work with what they want and what they they uh say they have the capacity to do Mm. and steer that towards getting stronger Mm -hmm. um otherwise it's not a match for me because my job is to help people get stronger um so i mean there's i guess you could argue that there's uh an agenda that i have but it's your job to have that but that's my job, right? Like they hired me ostensibly to get stronger. And so I, I try to look at what they have in, and this goes for both my nutrition clients and my lifting clients. What I'll see is, um, along with bar speed, a lot of what I'm monitoring is compliance mm-hmm. and compliance changes over time. And I, I, that was something that changed 
with that I picked up on really early on with online coaching is um, I would have these clients that would quit and I'd think, well, wow, they were getting PRs, they were making all this progress. And I started reflecting on, you know, what was leading up to them quitting. And, and nine times out of 10, I saw the compliance drop off. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't necessarily low compliance because some people just have consistently low compliance, Yeah, but it was a, it was a change in compliance. Mm-hmm. So if somebody went from a hundred percent day after day, week after week, month after month, and then all of a sudden they dropped down to like 80 or 70 mm-hmm. and they were just kind of like bouncing around. Uh, I used to just kind of think, oh, maybe that was just a bad week. If mm-hmm. somebody starts fluctuating compliance now, I'm immediately asking like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Like, everything okay with work? Like everything okay with life? And, and behind that, what I'm really trying to understand is not only what they care about, but what they have capacity to do. Mm. Because a lot of times with our programming, we get wrapped around the axle about like, well, what's the optimal volume or intensity? Yeah, we or, like how it looks on the on the computer. Right. And, and we've got these frameworks of three days a week or four days a week or X number of slots. But if the client doesn't have capacity to do it because it's a two-hour workout right, <laughs> mm-hmm. or because it's a 90% effort at the end of a, a day that they just don't have the energy to, to do it or they open up the app and they see they've got a 90% single, Mm -hmm. they just shut it down and they don't even do it, you know? So so like an effective program and what the client quote unquote needs, I'm listening for a combination of what they care about, what's motivating them and what they have capacity to do with an aim towards getting stronger uh, or as strong as I can get them. Because some people do come back and say, you know what? Sometimes I say, I really don't want to be maximally strong right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to be grinding on one RMs or um, PRing right now. Some people just they go through phases where you know I want to go on a a two day bike ride uh, in the mountains, you know, mountain bike ride or a swim. I've got one guy who's a swimmer and uh, competes regularly with um, uh, in the pool, and he's not going to be setting lifetime squat PRs necessarily like the week or two before. Sometimes you can, but mm-hmm. um, anyway, it's priorities and, and capacity, I think are the big things that I'm listening for. Uh, well, so this is a bit of a non sequitur, but when, you know, it goes back to some of the early questions on the uh, <clears throat> good coaching. Like, do you have an idea in your mind of like who you want to be as a coach or like, what the best version of yourself as a coach is, how do you, or how do you, like as a lifter, we have a model. Yeah. We look at ourselves and say, okay, yeah, we're squatting well. Yeah. How do you do that for yourself as a coach? Man, that's tough. And I feel like I'm going to answer this and all my clients are going to be like, wow, she doesn't do that at all. (laughs) (laughs) I think I want to always be someone who they can trust with for programming, Mm. but I also really want to make sure that I'm honest because it's like, I'm not the best programmer in the world. I don't know who is. Um, Mm. And it's not entirely predictable, but I always Mm. want to be honest with like what I think is going to work and what I think I did wrong. And, um, But still, I don't want to, when I open that door, I don't want to lose my, my position of being the person that they hired that they could trust. Who's the Mm -hmm. expert? You know, Mm -hmm. I think that's always a a line that I'm trying to make sure I walk carefully, like Mm -hmm. acknowledging my mistakes, but also being the one who should know what the hell they're doing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I like, I, I would like to be that kind of coach. And I also would like to be the coach who stays curious and creative with how I communicate with them. Like Mm -hmm. I, you know, I have, I've had some clients who I've just had with me for years and I love getting to see their videos, but I know that I might say the same things over and over and over again. And I want to be like really careful that I don't do that because that bothers me. (laughs) And so I've found that 
I have to make sure that I get really present to watching their, their lift and I'll start to explain things. Like if I feel like I'm starting to say the same thing over and over again, I'll like explain why something goes a certain way and then I'll try and come up with a new cue for it. Like I try to be creative mm-hmm. with how I'm trying to get my point across. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I always want to match their level of care. To be like, you know what? Oh, this is important to you. Okay. I want to make this important to me too. What about you? Uh, so I see my role as a coach um, and, and what I strive to do as a coach is a combination of what I mentioned earlier uh, being able to see somebody who let's see somebody for who they could become mm-hmm. and be able to help them also see themselves in that way. I think of the, of a client being on sort of their own personal strength journey. This might sound a little bit cheesy, but you know, they, they have some goal that they're, they're aiming at something that they're trying to accomplish Maybe it's health, maybe it's just absolute strength, maybe it's preparing for competition, whatever it might be. They're, they're trying to get somewhere. And I see my role as a coach as, as a guide to help them. Somebody who's been on similar journeys before or similar, similar paths. I have experience going towards those goals. And so I can help them kind of navigate that along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I can help them see themselves in that future state. Um, because mm-hmm. I think oftentimes when, especially with something as transformative as strength, when you first start working with somebody, their concept of what they're capable of is, um, mm-hmm. is nowhere near what they actually are. You know, when you, when you first start lifting 300 pounds sounds like a lot or mm-hmm. 400 pounds or 500 pounds sounds insane. Mm-hmm. Um, when it can be for many people, a normal amount of weight. And it's all obviously going to be specific to that individual, but whatever that number is to people starting out can seem unattainable and just like mythical. And and so I think one of the things that you can really help people with as a coach is to, is to normalize that, you know, to make it seem achievable and, Mm -hmm. and give that individual confidence and belief in their ability to get there. Sometimes I think that's, half the battle is just believing that you can get there. Um, and you hear that folks, you got to believe in yourself. Got to believe. <laughs> uh, and then obviously there's the technical aspect of providing feedback to the movements and lifts, but importantly doing that in a, a way that the, the client can hear it. Mm, yeah. Uh, there's, I think it's a John Wooden quote that says a, that a good coach is somebody who can provide feedback without creating a sense of resentment. Mm-hmm. You know, so like you can get out and post your videos on Instagram or the internet and get tons of feedback, but it's not going to be effective for you as a lifter if you can't hear it or if you can't accept it. Mm-hmm. And, and I, so I think that's a skill of coaching that goes along with building the relationship and being a good communicator Mm-hmm. And it's certainly been my experience throughout my life that the best coaches that I've had are the ones that are able to understand me enough and communicate in a way that's simple and effective. And that most importantly, I can actually hear. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that changes over time. Like you said, that changes on depending on the context, depending on your experience level. And I think that's part of the skill that I strive to do or that I strive to constantly improve is make sure that I'm, um, communicating at the right level with my client. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think those, are, that's kind of like the model that I uh, approach and that it, I think underpinning a lot of that is that it's the, it's uh, the lifters path, not mine. Yeah. So, so I am a strength coach and I'm always going to steer that direction, but it's, but it's their, their, their journey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I think is important because I think there's been a lot of times I've seen or I've felt that um, either I, in my sports or lifting career, lost track of what it was that I was doing for mm. myself. And I started doing things because it was important to somebody else. Yeah. 
this happened more when I was younger, I think, like getting caught up in caring what somebody else thought was important. But I think it's important for the, the client or the lifter to own their own training. Absolutely. Absolutely. Feel that. That's big. Or else they'll be thinking like, oh, well, this lifter does this, so I need to lift that much. Or I yeah. need this way. Or, you know, I want this for Instagram. And then it's just like, it's not going to go anywhere. It doesn't really. Right. Really, right. Yeah. And I mean, the whole purpose that we're doing this too, like in, in my the going back to the guide perspective is that, you know, there is going to be a time probably for every single client where they're going to move on to either a different coach or they're going to coach themselves. Like I don't want them dependent on me. Like Mm -hmm. it's like the, they are a capable independent human that wants to work with me because I can help them. Yeah. That's an interesting thing actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like when a client feels like they need to ask you for every single thing, you're not doing your job right. Right. They're not doing their job right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's a, it's not a, um, uh, what's the, there's probably some psychological term like codependent or uh, I don't know. There's some like, it needs to, it needs to be a healthy relationship with good boundaries and each person's kind of owning their part. Oh, right. the word. Yes. Yeah. The B word. The B word. <laughs> Do we need to talk about that? That's a whole nother 19 podcast episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think the important things we talked about were like understanding how things are going to shift over the lifespan of a client or of a lifter and of a client coach relationship, making sure there's like a, a pathway for communication to stay open Mm -hmm. just speaking so that what they're saying can be heard yeah matching care Mm -hmm. like that one a lot Mm -hmm. yeah so that's two people talking about coaching (laughs) yeah hopefully Um, that makes a podcast (laughs) (laughs) and uh, and just to wrap up Andrew where can people find you what's your Uh, home app yes well, uh, I can be found on Instagram at Andrew Barbender and uh, at barbelllogic.com. Yeah, great. Um, How about I you, don't Nikki? Have any more openings for coaching, but um, I am on the grams at Vera Nice. Uh, there's an underscore in there between Vera and Ness. And that's the only place that anybody else needs to know about. <laughs> boundaries <laughs> yes good healthy boundaries to be covered uh in the next next episode of nikki and andrew hijacking <laughs> <Watching podcast. laughs>